Hello, and welcome to Book Dreams, the podcast for everyone who loves books and misses English class. I'm Julie Sternberg, author of a number of children's books, including Like Pickle Juice and a Cookie and Summer of Stolen Secrets, a brand new middle grade novel. And I'm Eve Yohalem. I'm also a children's book author. My books include The Truth According to Blue and Cast Off, The Strange Adventures of Petra de Winter and Brom Broen. In each episode of this podcast, we consider a book-related topic. And in this episode, we consider what is it that is so special about the Babysitter's Club? What has its impact been? And what has it been like to edit the series for nearly three decades? Our guest, David Levithan, is editorial director at Scholastic Books, where he's edited both the Babysitter's Club series and the Hunger Games series, among many other books. At Scholastic, he's also the founding editor of the Push Imprint, which is devoted to finding new voices and new authors in teen literature. When he's not editing, David is a New York Times bestselling author of 23 books, including Boy Meets Boy, Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, which he co-wrote with Rachel Cohn, and most recently, The Mysterious Disappearance of Aiden S. as Told to His Brother. I was lucky enough to take a couple of classes that David taught. This was many years ago now, but I still remember him mentioning that when he first started working at Scholastic nearly 30 years ago as a 19-year-old intern, one of his very first assignments was putting together a series Bible for the Babysitter's Club. That quote-unquote Bible is a kind of continuity document that keeps track of all of the facts that have been established in a series, things like which characters live on which streets? What are their favorite foods? Do they have freckles? This was actually a critical assignment because even 30 years ago, there were already more than 50 books in what was to become a 300-book series. So there was a lot to keep track of. Anyway, David was already a force when I was his student. The film for his book, Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, was just coming out. The Hunger Games had started taking over the world. And here he was telling us how formative his experience with the Babysitter's Club series had been. I always wanted to ask him more about that, and I'm so glad that we got the chance to do it. Yeah, I am too. And before we get started, just a word about this juggernaut for readers who aren't familiar with it. So author Anne M. Martin began writing the books in 1986, and today there are more than 176 million copies in print worldwide. Wow. It's astonishing. The series, which is now beloved by multiple generations, is about a group of four friends who live in a Connecticut suburb and start a local babysitting service as a way to make money. Over the years, The Babysitter's Club has inspired spin-offs, graphic novels, a movie, a video game, and not one but two TV series, most recently on Netflix in 2019. So we started by asking David what his 19-year-old self had expected from this internship, and here's what he said. I was a sophomore going into junior year of college, and... As it happened, the one publishing listing in the career library at my school was for Scholastic. So completely blindly, I applied to Scholastic. I was like, oh, kids books, that sounds cool. (laughs) And I got an internship. And then very luckily for me, I went into Scholastic over spring break to talk to HR about my internship. I was that kind of kid. (laughs) They told me, oh, yes, we got a great assignment for you. We've assigned you to one of our science classroom magazines. And I (laughs) tried to remain appreciative while I gently explained to the HR person that I had actually chosen my college in part because I would never have to take a science class again. And that even though they were asking for a, a fifth grade cognizance of science, I wasn't quite sure that I could give that to them. She saw my fear and my my pain and switched me over to the book department. And then unbeknownst to me, a couple of weeks before I was set to arrive, the editorial assistant who worked on the Babysitter's Club left. And so the editor of the Babysitter's Club at the time, Bethany Buck, just needed somebody to fill in um, while she was interviewing and looking for a new assistant. So that is how I, I joined the Babysitter's Club. I certainly did not go into the job thinking that my life's calling would be to think like a 13-year-old girl, but very soon realized that in my skill set, fifth grade science was not there. Thinking like a 13-year-old girl was definitely there. I'm just trying to envision you know, a 19-year-old boy 
or young man being told he's going to spend his summer immersed in the babysitter's club and you know how that might feel. How, how did it feel? Honestly, I kind of had a blast. The telling moment for me was sometimes I'd take the work home with me. And so I'd be the guy on the subway with the babysitter's club highlighting passages. And goodness <laughs> only knows what people thought I was doing. But I loved being immersed and I loved that I was not the target audience, but it was fun to see the world building going on and to actually help them reconstruct that world in a definitive sense. Why do you think it's easy for you to channel a 13-year-old girl? I think it is, I, again, I, who knows? Certainly if I were straight, I wonder if the answer would be the same. So I think certainly being a gay 19-year-old reading The Babysitter's Club was different. Um, where that factors in, to be honest, is that most of my best friends in middle school and in high school were girls. Like I was always hanging out with the girls. I was always talking to the girls about what was going through their head at any given moment. So I was extremely familiar as a friend with the dynamics of girl friendship and of the emotions of being that age or near that age as a girl. And the fact that Stony Brook is sort of this suburb on, on the outskirts of New York City, and I was growing up in a suburb of the outskirts in New York City, I'm sure that had something to do with it as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Your role in working on the Babysitter's Club has obviously changed over the years. Can you tell us about the ways that your role changed over time? Yes. I mean, it's, I started off as an editorial assistant working with Bethany Buck. Um, and then eventually when Bethany left Scholastic, I took over as the series editor um, and sort of saw it through dozens of books. I don't know the exact count. And then what's been amazing is the series never really ended. When we launched our graphics imprint, the idea was, well, wait, why don't we turn the Babysitter's Club into graphic novels? And there was this amazing young BSC fan named Raina Telgemeier who we approached to adapt them. And we had no real idea of how they would bring the series back in such a huge way in tandem with Raina's solo work. But that gave the series a whole new life. And then, of course, along comes Netflix and the TV series, which gives it yet another life. And now we're repackaging the original books, which gives it another life. So there are now two or three generations of readers who have enjoyed The Babysitter's Club, and I've been there for most of them. <laughs> Yeah. And I suppose that doesn't often happen in an editor's career that you get to travel for so long with a project and through so many different iterations. Yeah. I mean, I would say it's pretty unprecedented. I would be hard pressed to think of another. I guess maybe there is an editor who still works on Nancy Drew and has been working on Nancy Drew for a long time, but it's very rare for a series to have so many iterations over so many decades. Yeah. Do you feel like your long-term relationship with the Babysitter's Club gives us a pretty accurate look at how an editor's responsibilities change as their careers progress? The Babysitter's Club has obviously been the biggest through line of my career at Scholastic, but the great thing about my career at Scholastic is that it's just taken me all over the place. At one point, sort of the heyday of me being the pilot of the Babysitter's Club program, I was also the pilot of our Star Wars program. Or now, sort of when I introduce myself in a talk or something, and they're like, oh, what do you do at Scholastic? I, I say that I had it both the Babysitter's Club and the Hunger Games. There's my range right there. Mm -hmm. I think the assumption would be that I sort of found my way through the Babysitter's Club and sort of kept in the realistic fiction and kept in the middle grade. But actually, what it really empowered me to do was do lots of different kinds of series and work with lots of different kinds of authors, which is why I'm still at Scholastic 29 years later. Yeah. I was going to ask you about this at the very end of our interview, but you mentioned being there for 29 years. This has nothing to do with our interview topic, but... My great uncle, Herman Mason, worked at Scholastic oh my God. for 72 years. And of I was going to ask you if you knew Herman at all. Well, of course, <laughs> he is the gold standard. Are you kidding me? When I made it into the Dinosaur Club after 25 years, I mean, he, Herman is the all-time legend dinosaur. We'd see him in the cafeteria and everybody knew who he was and everyone just 
admire the hell out of him. That's really funny, that connection, because, yeah, he's second probably only to Dick Robinson, our chairman, as like the most famous scholastic employee ever in-house. Herman used to tell stories about taking Dick Robinson to his first basketball game when Dick Robinson (laughs) was eight years old. He was there for 72 years. And I grew up coming to the offices. I would come Uh and and he would walk down the hall to the children's department and get a bunch of books for me. And it's very heartwarming to know that you remember him. Yeah, absolutely. That's adorable. And I'm not at all sure it's not going into the episode. Newsflash, we decided to keep Uncle Herman in the episode. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, we did. (laughs) You know, both David and my uncle started at Scholastic when they were very young. It was a first job for both of them. And then they just kept going and going and going. (laughs) Um, It's amazing. I mean, in my uncle's case, all he ever wanted to do was play sports. But his older sister, Frances, told him he couldn't play stickball on the street forever. And then she took him by the hand and enrolled him at NYU. And then after he finished college, she told him he had to get a job. So Herman never set out to be the longest serving editor in chief in world history. (laughs) I don't actually know officially if that's true, but he did it for 72 years. So it's got to be true, right? Yeah. Anyway, that's what my family says. (laughs) And there's a really interesting parallel here with Anne Martin because The Babysitter's series wasn't Anne Martin's idea. Jean Fowell, who's an editor at Scholastic, wanted to publish a series of four books about babysitters, and she hired Anne to write them. But they were so successful that Scholastic just kept publishing them. And then Anne, of course, went on to write more than 100 of these 300 plus books. I have to say, I'm always fascinated by how small or even random decisions can lead to a life's work. Yeah, it reminds me of Sally Roche Wagner, whom we interviewed in episode 46, which is a phenomenal episode, by the way. If you haven't heard it, go back and listen. A simple encounter with her mother's friend led her to focusing her entire career, more than 50 years, on reclaiming a place in history for suffragist Matilda Jocelyn Gage. You just never know what's going to take you where in life. So true. I mean, the only thing I ever planned to be was an opera singer, and that lasted until I was 24. (laughs) So ever since then, it's basically just been serendipity. Is that true for you? Well, you know, I was happily a lawyer at the ACLU for about a decade. I loved my work. I loved my colleagues. And then someone close to me passed away young, and I was like, life is short. And I was in the sort of, what do you really want to do? Life is short. Is this really how you want to be spending your time? at the end of the day. And I happened to walk past a flyer for a writing for children workshop. And that's how it started. I changed my whole career. So yes, absolutely. I believe in serendipity. It's so formative. Totally. Um, Well, anywho... (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> big right. pivot. We asked Good segue. David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We asked David to tell us more about books that originate with editors, and here's what he said. It happens all the time. I mean, again, whether it is you have an idea and then find the author, or whether you have an author in mind and you you approach them with an idea, um, and certainly a large part of my job now is idea development and finding the right person for them. And there are definitely a number of other best-selling properties that were editorial ideas or the ideas of a packager and so sort of the, the editors at a packager. Just for our listeners' sakes, what is a packager? A packager is a company that basically is a story machine. They will come up with an idea. They will find an author. They will then sell the idea and the book to a publisher. And then usually they will keep all of the foreign rights and all of the movie rights so they can then sell them. Alloy is one of the most famous packagers. They're behind Gossip Girl, Sister of the Traveling Pants. That is what they do. How common is it for the author of a series not to write all of the books in a series? And how does Anne's 100 out of 300 number compare to other series authors? I mean, I think the first question to ask before asking that question is, how many series make it past book 30? The answer is probably 5%, maybe less than 5%. I think it's only when a series is as long as the Babysitter's Club was. And again, at the heyday of the Babysitter's Club, there were three or four different Babysitter's Club or Babysitter's Little Sister or various spin-offs books coming out a month, it would have been physically impossible for one person to write them. 
So that is when other writers are brought in. What makes Anne unique is that she did always thank the other writers in the books. You can tell which ones she had help with and which ones she didn't because of the acknowledgements. So I would say that it is not unusual for a series of that length to have other writers in there. What is unusual is for the other writers to get the credit that they did. How did you select the other writers? And what input did you and Anne have in the books that they wrote? Because there were so many books coming out in such a short time, I mean, we really had it down to a science. We would brainstorm the ideas together, just have a phone call and be like, okay, book 83, what should we do with book 83? Once we had an idea, I would sort of type up basically the notes and type up the idea. And then Anne, for every single book, wrote an outline and a very detailed outline for each book, chapter by chapter, breaking it down. And that really was what we would give the writers to then fill in the blanks. Once they wrote it, I would, as the editor, would edit it and make sure that it sounded like the Babysitter's Club. And then when we had page proofs, Anne would read every single set of page proofs to make sure that everything sounded in line with the other books. And as far as how the authors were chosen, honestly, by the time I started, most of the writers were on board. We basically had a rotating cast of maybe eight or nine authors over eight or nine years writing books. And what is it, do you think, that accounts for the Babysitter's Club's phenomenal success? I think it was the right series at the right time. I think ultimately what made it so popular was that the readers really thought of the characters as their friends and really thought of them as real people having real world thoughts and problems and humorous situations. A lot of it was aspirational. It was third, fourth, fifth graders reading about these seventh or eighth graders and sort of thinking like, oh, wow, one day I'm going to get to babysit and I'm going to be just like that. And then there was the entrepreneurial spirit of these girls forming this club to, to make money and do a service for their community, which I think also resonated. But I think mostly it was the characters. It was the fact that you got to know them really well in the first book, and then you got to get to know them more and more and more as the series developed. And thinking about the entertainment options in the late 80s, there was very, very little for kid readers that really could give them that glimpse of a realistic world that they could basically take into their life in such a huge way. Well, and speaking of getting to know the characters really well, why did Anne Martin put a character with type 1 diabetes in the series? And what kind of research was Anne doing or other people doing to make sure that the disease was represented accurately? It's very interesting because I was part of an interview about sensitivity and authenticity readers a couple of years ago because publishers are using them so much now, and rightfully so. And I was laughing a little because with the Baby Search Club, we always had expert and authenticity readers. If we had a medical issue, whether it was diabetes, whether it was the book where Jesse learns about eating disorders, we always would have a medical professional read the books because we knew that kids were reading these books and they were treating it like it was real life. So we had to make sure that it was realistically portrayed. And obviously, as time has gone on, that has continued to be our mandate and specifically the diabetes. Obviously, the treatment of diabetes has changed markedly since 1986. And so with all of the books, when we are repackaging them, we're adapting them to graphic novels or Netflix when they adapted it, we always make sure to make it up to date so that we are not having Stacy doing things with needles that aren't done anymore for kids with diabetes. Like if, if kids are wearing insulin pumps, we add an insulin pump to the story. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned from the Babysitter's Club, about editing, about writing, about girlhood? I think about writing, oh my goodness, it, it was a masterclass in structure. Those books, there are always 15 chapters. There was always the chapter two that sort of gave you the summary of everything just in case you were picking up this book for the first time, or this was the first book in the series you were picking up. There were always three babysitting chapters, usually at different intervals, so there was a little leeway there. But literally, when I would 
learn to outline, I would basically take a legal pad and I would write columns for number one through 15. And then I would start to figure out what happened in each of the chapters. And I would do this not just for Babysitter's Club, but I would do this for other books that I was working on. And it taught me a lot about structure and pacing because I do think those books are so masterful in how they are structured. Having a template freed your mind from having to worry, oh, how am I going to structure the story? When it's inherent, you can spend time on things like character and things like plot. I think that as far as the characters and what they taught me, it, it was to be an honest writer. That That is what made Anne and still makes Anne connect with readers is they know she is being honest with them and the characters are being honest, even when they get things wrong or especially when they get things wrong. It always feels very truthful. And certainly for me as a writer, that has been a great lesson, but also as an editor, it has made me really be vigilant about if an author sort of seems to be not true to life or seems to to be hedging about something, to point them towards the more honest direction, because I know that the readers will respond to that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the re-release of the books as graphic novels? How did that decision get made? In retrospect, it was a somewhat daring choice. If you looked at the graphic novel space, it did, certainly did not lean heavily towards girls, and it really did not lean heavily to girls in a realistic setting. It was very much superheroes. And so mm -hmm. what Raina did, both with the Baby Series Club and then with her solo work, starting with Smile, was revolutionary in its way, saying that sort of a slice of life story about a girl or four girls could be just as compelling and just as popular as any superhero or fantasy world or Marvel or DC adventure. And that's what ended up happening. You've said that you don't think there could be a sisterhood of the traveling pants without the Babysitter's Club. And so I'm wondering generally, like, what influence do you think the Babysitter's Club has had on storytelling? I mean, books, movies. Oh, my goodness. It is almost impossible to quantify how important it is. I mean, I would say it is about on par with Harry Potter in, insofar as an entire generation of writers was inspired to write by the Babysitter's Club. When you read the New York Times book reviews by the book, anytime they interview an author of a certain age in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, and then it gets to the, what did you read as a kid? People from all different backgrounds, all different reading backgrounds, all different places in the country or the world all of them will cite the Babysitter's Club. Elizabeth Acevedo just said Babysitter's Club was one of the things she loved to read as a kid. And it's just fun because they're the people where you see the direct through line, like the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants or Jenny Han, we know is a, a very big Babysitter's Club fan. And, and again, you see the characters she writes and you're like, yeah, I can see that she loved the Babysitter's Club. But then if you read The Poet X, by Elizabeth Acevedo, you wouldn't necessarily immediately go, oh, she must have grown up on the Babysitter's Club. But it was the fact that books were so important to you and these characters were so important that completely was inspiring for a generation of writers. Whether they are writing things that are similar to what Anne writes or whether they're writing something that's completely different in form, the inspiration is still there. Okay, one last very important question. Why is Boy Crazy Stacy your favorite Babysitter's Club? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, I, it is, it is, I mean, it's just like, it's the perennial. I mean, it, it's that title, it's that cover, it's Sea City. I mean, it is the, the most free-spirited of the early Babysitter's Club books. It also has a very wise sense of humor about the mistakes that Stacey is making by ditching her best friend to fall in love with a lifeguard who will never love her back. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's all of those elements. There are many others that I love, but yeah, that one, that's just the most fun to say. As far as titles go, you'll never top Boy Crazy Stacy. Okay, I've read 
Boy Crazy Stacy. Ooh, and? Well, David's right. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's really, really funny. So if you haven't read any Babysitter's Club books, now you know where to start. Yeah, and on that note, I mean, I, I can't think of a better way to leave you. Go read that book. Yeah, Boy Crazy Stacy. <laughs> Boy Crazy Stacy. <laughs> That's absolutely. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like the podcast and think someone else would too, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to let us know if there's a book-related topic you've wondered about, and we'll try looking into it in a future episode. You can reach us for that reason or any other at contact at bookdreamspodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at bookdreamspod and on Instagram at bookdreamspodcast. You can find David at www.davidlevithan.com. Many thanks to our producer, Gianfranco Lentini, and to our theme music composer, Maya Polsky. You can find Eve at eveohallam.com and me at juliesternberg.com. And check out the podcast website, www.bookdreamspodcast.com. Until next time, happy book dreaming. Happy book dreaming. Love, come listen to Book Dreams with Julian.